overseeing the giving of gifts to our children. Um, as the Bible tells us that we should really take care of our own. And this is what, uh, this is our second year of doing this, so we will continue to, indeed, take care of our own children. Um, we know that uh, the giving the gifts does not really define Christmas for us. But first of all, since the ushers are standing here, um, those of you who didn't, not my wife and I, we passed out letters last week. For those of you who didn't get a letter, just let the ushers know and they'll give you, give you a letter. And also, if you need a Bible, raise your hand and, and they'll give you a Bible. Like I say, it's a wonderful thing to see our children receive gifts, to see their joy on their faces, to see how happy they are to do, for doing that. But see, we also have responsibility. Our children must realize that what Christmas is really all about, and we know that Christmas is not about the giving of gifts to each other. And so we do have that responsibility, how we know they look forward to gifts, as all children do, to let our children know that really the reason for the season. I, I noticed, and you probably have noticed also, that uh, Christmas is becoming more and more commercialized every single year. And just down on, on me the other day that uh, when you go to the stores or you look at commercials, Christmas is defined by either Santa Claus or, or the giving of gifts. It's have absolutely nothing to do <laughs> with Christmas, don't get it? But that's the way it's defined right now. But we know Santa Claus has nothing to do with the season. The giving of gifts have nothing to do for the reason of the season. We know the reason for the season is the commemoration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's the reason for the season. And if you take Christ out of Christmas, and the word Christ is in the word Christmas, if you take Christ out of Christmas, you no longer have Christmas, okay? But you can take Santa Claus out of Christmas and you still have Christmas. So the season is all about Christ and that's what it's really all about. And we just want our children to know that. As each generation comes up, we want them to know what the season is really all about. So we had a responsibility to teach our children the real reason for the season. As we know, a couple weeks ago, well really about three, four weeks ago, we started this series, David and I, and it was on the Advent. And Advent, I explained to you, meant coming of Christ. And I explained that the Advent really started back in the 1600s. The church started the Advent season. And we are in the Advent season. And this is the week, the ending week of the Advent season. And you may remember, and I brought out in that sermon about three, three weeks ago, about the Advent season. It was to focus on the second coming of Jesus Christ. And to do that, we focus on his birth because it tells us how he kept his promise about his first coming, the first advent. And he kept his promise about that. So in lieu of how we, how we celebrate Christ's birth, it's also to remind us of his second advent, his second coming. And that if God kept his promise about the first coming, God will indeed keep his promise about Lord Jesus Christ's second coming. So let me share this one scripture with you before we get started today. But Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 it covers his first coming and the advent of his second coming but it says for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen? Amen. So right here, we can see what Christmas is really all about. It's about the birth of our Lord and Savior and about the second coming, as Isaiah says here, his second coming, establishing his kingdom here on earth where righteousness will reign forever. Amen. If you will uh, stand with me now as we read Romans, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. It 
It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of the King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's, the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Ju Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Okay. Let's bow our heads. God, our Heavenly Father, Father, we, we're here today, Father, to finish out the year, Father, in a comm comm commemoration, in a rec the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father. We're here to show our appreciation. We're here to show reverence, honor, to worship our Lord and Savior, to show him how much you appreciate what he had done for each of us, Father. All motivated by love. So, Father, we ask the Holy Spirit now to work with each of us so we get a great appreciation of the love that you showed mankind by giving your only begotten son so he would die for our sins so we could spend our eternity in your kingdom, Father. So, Father, now fill us with your spirit. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears to the message today that you have prepared for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As you, as you know, tomorrow then it's Christmas. And they chose, the church basically chose December 25th as the day to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we all know that it wasn't actually December 25th, but that is not the point. Because it is not important the day we celebrate it, but it's important that we recognize the event. This was the event that was the most significant event that ever happened to mankind with the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So what's important then is for us to recognize the event. This is an event that changed the world. The moment that Jesus was born, it changed the entire world. So the question comes to mind, then what would, what was the motive behind, what was the driving force behind this event? What was the driving force of having Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, born. And that driving force is explained to us in John 3.16. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, this was a driving force of that event that happened. The birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was driven by love, the love that God had for us. See, this verse is very, very important here. Let's read it again, but read it along with me. Let's read it together here. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Amen. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, it was driven, that event that we... 
tomorrow. That we're celebrating today, Christmas, the birth of our Lord and Savior was driven by love. 1 John chapter 4, 1 John tells us there multiple times that God is a God of love. Everything he does is motivated by the love that he has for us. If you go back to Genesis, when he created the heavens and the earth and everything in it, when he created the animals and he created Adam and Eve, when he finished on the sixth day, he said, everything was very good. Because everything he does is very good because it is motivated by his love. Everything he does is motivated by love. The garden, the garden of Eden there, it was a beautiful garden. There was not a single thorn in that garden perfect beauty in that garden. The animals had a fear of mankind because we were created in God's image. Everything God's done is perfect in beauty, but it's motivated by love. See, it was love of God that created the world, and it was the love of God that changed the world. And the world was changed by the birth of Jesus Christ. At his birth, because of his birth, some people were overjoyed. Some were startled, like we read about King Herod, or, or he was disturbed. And some people are disturbed over his birth. See, those who were overjoyed because of birth were those who had been waiting generation after generation for the Messiah to be born. They had faith and trust in, in God's word, the Old Testament. So they were overjoyed at his birth. But then there were others who were startled. They were startled because they say, oh, the Bible is true. God did keep us where there was a Messiah born. They were startled because now they had to evaluate their own life to see how they were living. Were they living a godly life? Or were they doing what they wanted to do? So some people were startled like, what am I going to do? The Bible is true. God did keep his word. And then there were other people who were disturbed, I can hear it, disturbed by the fact of Jesus' birth. They were disturbed by the fact because they wanted to do their own thing, see, so the only thing they could do is try to deny his birth. King Herod wanted to actually kill baby Jesus. But some people are simply disturbed by it. So we can see that because of Jesus' birth, that some people... Because of birth, now worry. Some people are in fear because of birth, because of the way they're living their lives. Some people are now feel very insecure because they know, indeed, the Bible is true. If Jesus came the first time, he's going to come again the second advent of Christ. So now some people see are disturbed over that. They're worried over that. They have fear over that. Okay? Some people try to ignore or they try to rationalize his birth. Because bottom line is they don't want to surrender their life. They don't want to humble themselves. They don't want to surrender their life to God. They want to do their own thing. Okay. When Jesus was born, there was everlasting joy, joy now that had entered the world. Because up until that time, there was no hope. There was no real joy in, in the world at that time. But see, joy comes from when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Savior. There's an everlasting joy that comes when we surrender our life to Jesus, when we realize the love God has for us, the depth of his love for us. When we come to that realization, not only here, but it finally reaches our heart, how much God really loves us, so much he gave his only son, when that finally reaches our heart, that's when our life begins to change. That's when God now starts to do a good work in us. As Paul said in Philippians 1, 6, it says, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. See? Making reference to the second advent again, Christ's return. The moment that we surrender ourselves, the moment we humble ourselves, accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, 
the Holy Spirit begins a good work in us. Gets changing us, molding us, humbling us. And that work will continue until Christ returns. There was probably a time in your life where you were searching. Before you knew Christ, there was probably a time in your life where you were searching, but maybe you didn't know searching for what? Joy, happiness, contentment, peace. See, there's a time probably when most of us were searching, kind of lost out in the world, but we really didn't know what we were searching for, but we were searching, see. And then we found Christ. He entered our life. See, and then we begin to have this peace that, that we were searching for. We begin to have that peace, see. Then as we matured in our walk with the Lord, we became more trusting of him. Our faith strengthened. And we finally reach a point in our, in our walk with the Lord where we trust the Lord completely. When you trust the Lord completely, when you trust God completely, that's when you will surrender everything. It gets rid of your fears, your anxieties, your worries. You give them all to Christ. Why? Because you know he loves you. you should, just the fact that God loves you and he proved it should give you so much contentment in life. That you know there's not a single thing that you should worry over. That you should be anxious over. There should not be anything at all. Just knowing that the Heavenly Father, He loves you. And He proved His love for you. But at this time when we surrender our all to Christ, our worries, our cares, that's when we begin to experience that true peace. That peace that can only come from above. There's not much known about the Messiah, um, the uh, Magi that we read about. The Magi we know today, we would refer to them as astrologers, but they had the ability to look at the heavens, to look at the stars, and from that they could tell that there was a king born. Yeah. They traveled over 2,000 miles. They knew the scriptures also, and they knew this king would be born in Bethlehem. They traveled over 2,000 miles because they did not want to miss the event. They wanted to give honor and glory to this king. They, they, they wanted to worship this king because they knew there would be a king born that would change the world, and they knew this. That's why they traveled 2,000 miles to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, the world at that time also needed a change. People were born, they worked, they died. Born, they worked, and they died. There was no hope. There was no joy. They had been waiting thousands and thousands of years for God to fulfill his promise about a Messiah. So looking at the stars, they could tell, no, this king of the Jews had been born. He's going to change the world, the world, and they wanted to be a witness to that. There are many wise people today out in the world who they look around and they see the world needs a savior. There's no hope in the world. There's no joy outside of this church. You can see. There's no hope. Many people wonder what is life really all about? I read about a result of a survey last week dealing with prayer. And the survey was shocking because they said now there are even atheists who don't even believe in God, but there are now even atheists who are praying. They're not praying for God, but they're praying to someone because they realize there's no hope in the world. There's no reason to live. There's no joy. They realize it. And they're praying for someone to come and to save the world because there's no hope. See, the Magi realize also, in Jesus' day, no different than, I, than ours. They had no hope. But now they could tell this Savior, this King, that's going to change the world, is finally going to be born. So they visited the King, as we know, in Bethlehem. And they presented with him gifts. 
And it was normal to give king a gift to show respect. But they gave the king gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, not realizing that these physical gifts had a reflection on the spiritual and the physical life of Jesus Christ. The gold that they gave him was to signify his kingship. Okay? The frankincense that they gave him, perfume, but with also a symbol of his priestly role. And the myrrh that they gave him, see, it, it, was, it was like a uh, prefiguring his crucifixion. And that's what those gifts were really represented. They not even knowing how those three gifts are playing a part on God's will. Praying a part, prefiguring the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Magi, like, they were seekers of the Savior. And it's anyone who is seeking God, anyone who is seeking to live a righteous life. When they found God, when they found the baby, Jesus Christ, they honor him, they worship him, they gave him the gifts. They showed him reverence. They humbled themselves before him because they knew this was a king that was going to change the world. And this is the way it should be with any of us as we were searching. And when we found Jesus, when we found our Lord and Savior, that we humbled ourselves, that we surrendered ourselves to his will. We accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Think about God's love. Not only how it changed the world, but how did it change you? See, and I know it has. See, if you think of God's love, see, it can't help but humble you. When you think about the creator of all there is, the creator of the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in it, when you think about the creator and you think about ourselves as just a speck of dust, see, it humbles you, the fact that he would choose you to spend eternity with you. See, if you just think, and how he showed his love for us, see, just that fact alone will humble you. Why does he love me so much? Why did he choose me? Why did he do so much for me? See, it will humble you. So yeah, God's love humbled you. And I know you all have been humbled because a proud person will not accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. A proud person will not do that. They want to be the master of their own faith. A humble person, see, acknowledges the fact that they are a sinner. A humble person acknowledges the fact that, that they need a Savior. A humble person acknowledges God's love for them. And they receive it with open arms. Okay. A humble person, because of that, will receive everlasting life. And God is love. One of his greatest, if not the most profound attribute he has is his love, okay? God's love is manifested through the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through his birth, we, he showed us how much he loves us. Okay? Through Jesus' birth, now God was finally put into position to fulfill his will. He was finally put in a position to keep his promise. He was put in a position now to answer the cries of mankind. Take care of the needs of mankind. You see, up until then, see, we, we, we were slaves of sin and death. And we had no way out. There's nothing we could do. But it was out of God's love that he gave us a way out. And all we have to do is accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Yeah, like God's love through Jesus Christ, yes, gave hope to the world. It gave joy to the world. It gave hope to those who had no hope. It gave joy to those 
who had no joy. God's love is commanded. As a matter of fact, we're commanded to love God. All through the scriptures, we are commanded. Jesus was asked this question. Which is the greatest of all commandments? Hundreds and hundreds of commandments. Which is the greatest one? Jesus answered this way. He said in Matthew 22, 37, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. If you look at this, this is encompassing the, our whole being. It says, love the God, love the Lord your God with all your heart. The heart, the seat of motivation down here, that, that motivates us to do things. That's where our beliefs reside. That's what it's talking about. It says, love God down here in your heart. That you're motivated. Everything you do is because you're love of God. So it says, love God with all your heart. And then it says, with all your soul, your spirit. Look at God and be motivated to do things of the Spirit. Have desires for the Spirit. So it says loving with your, all your soul and with all your mind, the physical. Everything that you think about, everything that you want to do, everything in your life, God should be first in our thoughts and all that we do. So when we look at this, we can see Jesus is saying, no, you love God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, and with your entire mind. And then he said the second greatest commandment in verse 29 is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the commandments in the Bible from cover to cover is all summed up in love. That's why it says God is love. If we love God, we will keep his commandments. If we love God, he will be first in our life. Okay? If we love our neighbor, see, if we love God, we won't do, sin against him. If we love our neighbor, we won't sin against our neighbor. We won't do any harm to our neighbor. We love him as ourselves. So we can see that all the commandments, and if I had verse 30, 40 up here, you would see that it tells you all the commandments of the Bible are summed up in those two verses. Love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Paul tells us that love never fails. All our woes, concerns, trials and tribulations, all that can be resolved by love. Our love for God. Okay? It can all be resolved that easy because of, because of the love that we have for God. We will have a fuller life, the Bible tells us. And if our love for Jesus Christ is now, we will have everlasting life. So it's all bound up in love. Okay? And if we love God as we should, God responds to us. The Bible tells us in 1 John, verses 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on you that you shall be called children of God. He lavishes on us. He didn't hold back. He lavishes on us. God said, if you accept my son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, see, now you become children of God. Children of God. Just think about that. He lavishes with that. God's love... Change the world also of non-believers. And they're not even aware of that. You're probably wondering how would God's love change the life of non-believers. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5.13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. He's speaking about us. See, salt was used as a preservative and salt was used also to bring the flavor out, the taste out in food, that it tastes better. So when Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth, what is he actually saying? See, we're preserved, a preservative in the sense that we preserve the qualities of God. The fruits of the Spirit is goodness, kindness, love, self-control. Patience, goodness. We preserve that within the world. We display this to the world. They see the godly qualities in us. And it affects them. When it says that we are the salt of the, the earth, 
We make the earth a better place to live, more palatable place to live. A better place to raise your children, raise your family. And that's what Jesus said. We are the salt of the earth. So God's love through us also changes the life of non-believers. It makes the world a more palatable place to live all because of us. Jesus also said in verse 14, it says, you are the light of the world. To each of us individually are the light of the world. Some of our lights are brighter than others, but Jesus said, we are the light of the world. We bring light to the world. We bring hope to the world. We bring joy to the world. The fact that we spread the gospel to others, it gives them believers, it gives them hope. It gives them a reason for living, a reason to change their life. So yes, God's love through us, yes, makes the world a better place to live even for non-believers. We are living proof that God's love changed the world because he changed each one of us. One by one, he changed each one of us. One by one, he took the veil off of our eyes so we could see his love for us. We are proof, yes. God's love changed the world because God's love has changed each of us. The Apostle Paul spoke, or speaks for us, let's say, when he's at Romans 8.39, when he says, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is, in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, he is speaking for us. This is the way we feel. There is nothing, no thing or no one should ever separate us from the love of God. That means family, friends, no thing, it doesn't matter. Nothing, absolutely nothing should separate us before our love of God. Nothing should come before God. And that's what Paul is saying. There's nothing out there in all the creation that we should allow to come between us and our love for God. Nothing. God's love changed the world. It changed each of us. We are now children of God. We have a heavenly Father. And that's all fathers, they want the best for their children. They don't want to see their children suffering through pain and suffering. Our Heavenly Father is the same, see. He doesn't want to see us go through pain and suffering and death. See, fathers want the best for their children. Everlasting joy, everlasting peace, everlasting life. Our Heavenly Father is no different. Not only did he give his only begotten son to us to pay for our sins, that all we have to do is surrender our life to him. Not only that, but God says, I promise us, he said, I have another thing for you, another promise for us. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Has never been conceived, never been seen or heard of. The thing that God has waiting for us, for those of us that love him, can you see the depth of God's love for us? Can you only imagine what is waiting for us? Because of the love of God. And all we have to do is live a sacrificial life and put him first in our life. Accept his son as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father.
Father, thank you for the message today. The depth of your love, Father, is just unimaginable. That you would give your only son, your only begotten son, to die for our sins. And the things that you have waiting for us, you not only adopted us as children of yours, which means that we're going to inherit but your only begotten son. We're going to have the same inheritance, Father. That you have things waiting for us in heaven that's unimaginable. That all we have to do now is just these short few years of our life is just keep you first in our life. To show our love for you. It's not to put anyone between us and our love for you. To surrender our life our whole heart, mind, soul, strength to you, Father, to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Father, this is the season where we recognize that great love you showed for us. Help us now, Father, be filled with that joy, just knowing we have a Father that loves us. We have a Father, He proved His love for us. Just that thought alone should give us contentment. It should give us peace that we should never be concerned about anything or worry about anything because of the depth of your love. Help us now, Father, not only to grasp this mentally, but that it will go down into our heart that it will motivate us like Jesus said the greatest commandment of all that it will motivate us to love you with our whole heart all of our soul and all of our strength Father we love you dearly and Father I ask these things according to your will in Jesus name Amen.